welcome everyone to Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, a conversation circle that we sponsor here at Still and Moving Center every Saturday afternoon. And this Saturday, we are on the theme of participating in the cosmic dance. We are very fortunate to have with us Janani Lakshmanan, who is a very skilled and long practiced Bharatanatyam dancer herself. And that is the tradition from which she will be speaking to us on uh, this subject. Janani has um, danced at Stella Moving Center, uh, presenting a, a series of workshops. She's also uh, participated in the most recent Diwali performance that uh, we put on, um, giving a sacred mantra, as well as performing Bharatanatyam. Um, and having her uh, young dancers perform Bharatanatyam for us. Um, she's currently uh, st studying for her doctorate, I believe, at UH. And um, we're just so pleased and honored to have you, Janani. Thank you for being here. Um, well, Janani, uh, this week uh, we will be uh, celebrating Maha Shivaratri, an ancient and very holy um, Hindu festival. And I wonder what that might have to do with the cosmic dance. I think uh, I can always answer any of your questions uh, from the perspective of, of myself and then the, the version of myself that's a dancer. And so for Shivaratri, um, the significance of that day is, of course, just the idea that Nataraja is um, performing his dance uh, throughout the entire 24 hour cycle that we think of as a day. Um, and usually it's practiced in a way that uh, an offering to Shiva is made in the form of some kind of, of fast, I guess you could call it. Um, and the most common way to worship Shiva on the day of Maha Shivaratri is to observe a sleeping fast. So you would stay awake the entire night and worship in one way or another um, in order to uh, sort of honor his performance, his dance of creation. Okay. And that's a really interesting word for you to use, creation. Um, I understand that the Hindu Trimurti, which is the view of the divine um, in a threefold aspect, uh, includes Brahma as um, the, the aspect of the universe um, that represents creation, Vishnu, that which sus, um, supports, uh, sustains creation, and then Shiva as um, that which um, destroys for the sake of recreating uh, <laughs> the universe. So tell us about this dance of creation. Of course. Um, so again, I, I again speaking from my perspective as a dancer, I'm not a theologian by any minute, by any means. So I can only tell you the stories that I've been raised with as a child. Um, and I would say that generally Vishnu is regarded as the preserver of life, as you said, um, and Shiva the destroyer and Brahma the creator. But the original creation myth that I'm aware of, at least, is that Vishnu was born out of nothingness, Brahma was born from Vishnu, and Shiva was born of Brahma. So really, it's a it's a sort of stacked trinity, if you will, that um, there's a sort of hierarchy there. Um, and in some sense, they, like, if, if those were the original three creations, then Shiva had the responsibility, I guess, of, of deciding what was to come next. Um, and Brahma took over the creation process of life specifically, whereas Shiva formed the universe. So the, the sort of inorganic matter that sort of comprises uh, all of reality. And so when we talk about the, the dance of creation and the dance of destruction, we're actually talking about two different forms of dance that Shiva is dancing and two specific dances. So um, in the quote that was in the reading, um, they talk about the Ananda Tandava, the dance of creation, but that's not what that translates to. Tandava is a specific, 
it's an adjective really to describe a kind of dance, a very forceful, um, rhythmic, vigorous kind of dance. Its counterpart in dance theory is um, lasya, which is grace. Um, so Shiva Nataraja, as the god of dance, is performing this very intense dance on this Mahashivaratri day. And it's Ananda Tandava, which Ananda means happiness or bliss in Sanskrit. Its counterpart is Rudra, which is anger. So a dance of creation is performed when Shiva is blissful and a dance of destruction is performed when Shiva is rageful. And those two counterparts are what sort of continue to carry forth um, the cycle of, of creation and destruction. Mm. Oh, I'm so glad to have that clarified. So at Mahashivaratri, there would be this blissful dance of creation and right. one poses that would be recreation out of the ashes of the destruction of the previous dance <laughs> that cleared away the, the universe so to speak oh okay um, and in fact if you if you look at any like hindu astrological calendar and i can say this because i have one in my house um they have Pradosham, which is actually uh, an example of when Shiva is performing the uh, dance of destruction. So that happens every month. There's a Pradosham every month where Shiva is angry. Um, and I think some of us can relate to that. <laughs> There's just some days where we're all in a bit of a mood to smash things. <laughs> but uh, So is there a similar act? There must be because uh, Shivaratri ha happens monthly, and it's just Maha Shivaratri, I believe that happens. That's the Pradosham, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah. Good. Um, and there's a very um, sacred spot um, where Maha Shivaratri is particularly celebrated, which I believe is to the Chidambaram, the temple of Chidambaram. And I think that means a lot to you as a Bharatanatyam dancer. Yes. You want to talk about that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so Chidambaram, Chidambaram is what it's called now. It comes from the old Tamil words Chitra Ambalam, which is the place of thought. So Chidambaram is the fifth of five sacred um shiva temples in the south of india and each of them has a particular dedication to an element and to a specific form of nataraja um chidambaram being the fifth and sort of the best for last um represents the element of ether which is cosmos or space or sky however you choose to think of it um and in some sense there's there's a there's a secret found in chidambaram which is behind a curtain um the secret of chidambaram is said to reside and the secret is that there's nothing behind the curtain and that's precisely what shiva is he is everything and nothing non-being and being still and moving all of these dichotomies are presented in at this place of thought um because there's one thing that's unique, I would say, to um, to my faith and my personal traditional practice is that it's very comfortable with the idea of paradox. And I think that's why I resonate with the idea of Chidambaram um, and like the idea that this place of thought and thought is a very linear, logical thing to most of us can become so comfortable with paradox. But again, like I said, and like you mentioned, um, Chidambaram is, is a very holy place for a lot of dancers and myself included. Um, it's uh, Mahashivaratri is celebrated on immense scale there. It's, it's celebrated for about two weeks. And um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to present a dance there in praise of Lord Nataraja at Chidambaram at Chidambaram's Natya Anjali festival. So Natya meaning dance, Anjali meaning offering. So it's an offering of dance at this festival in praise of Shiva. And did you say that was or was not at Mahashivaratri? It was, yeah. So it's a two week long festival surrounding. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
And uh, tell us about that. What wasn't there something special about that particular dance for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So this piece that I presented is a Varnam, which is the longest uh, sort of piece that's presented in any classical Bharatanatyam repertoire, at least. Um, and it comes from a poem that was written in praise of the Shiva at Chidambaram. And I learned it for my Arangetram, which is the word used to describe your professional dance debut as a, as a student of this art form. Um, it was really important to me that I had initially conceived of the idea of presenting my dance debut at Chidambaram, at this temple. Um, so I asked my teacher for a dance commemorating that specific place, that very specific place of thought, um, and that, and all the symbolism and all the ideas that went went into that. Um, so she went to her teacher, so sort of up the up the hierarchy of dance education, um, and asked for such a piece, and the piece was set to dance rhythm so that the piece had been composed already but was set to dance rhythms specifically for me for my feet to dance it at this holy place um and unfortunately due to logistics uh i wasn't able to perform my debut at chidambaram but i performed it in india and it was always a goal of mine to like i said perform it uh, perform it at natyanjali which is that festival surrounding Mahashivaratri and I accomplished that. Oh. It was an incredible place. Um, I think as a dancer, I felt a great deal of connection to all the dancers at that place. And I also have never been in such an inspirational sort of place where dancers are willing to leave their ego aside and um, just connect to each other over a common shared devotion to Nataraja. Mm -hmm. Um, can you um, speak to this idea of participating in the cosmic dance, mm -hmm. that experience? It's an interesting question. I, I will admit, I haven't actually thought about what it would mean for every one of us to participate in the cosmic dance. I think to me, I think that's what was interesting about the first quote, of course, the idea that um, even if you don't have a personal connection to dance and to movement in that form, that there is still a connection within you to Nataraja. Um, and I would say that Nataraja and dance in general is a very good reminder to myself, to the people around me, to sort of the members of the audience, if you will, um, that we're all a part of something bigger, and that the self is really just such a tiny part of that. Um, I mean, I like I was saying, I have a dance performance coming up this week, and, and I'm in rehearsals every single day. Um, and the reason for that is even though I'm 100% ready, or so I feel to ascend the stage and, and, and perform opening night, that doesn't mean that everyone else in that in that crew and the, the cast and, and the costumers, everything that goes into making that show possible isn't necessarily ready. And so it's not up to me, right? Like it's not up to me when opening night is. It's not it's not it's 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 not about me and i think that that's like a really simple way of thinking about the cosmic dance that like if not everyone is 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 performing their role in this ecosystem this grand universal scheme it's not gonna it's not gonna work it's gonna fall apart <laughs> and so in some sense it's about humility it's about even though the idea of dance and of performance and as dancers we can fall very easily into like a self-indulgent egoistic mindset um as though it's us that are somehow the uh creators of of beauty of art of grace but really we are the instrument that the universe plays 
in order to express a, a particular tune or story or um, mythological epic um, or even just a single emotion. That's a very like important idea, I think, for me as a dancer and to think about what participating in the cosmic dance is, is it's out of my hands. Um, and the idea that I have control over the universe, over that cosmic dance is an illusion. Well, that's a wonderful answer for somebody who hasn't thought of that particular question in that way. <laughs> you know, I know you need to uh, leave us in uh, about 13 minutes, so I want to open up the floor to everyone else here for any uh, comments or questions that they might want to address while you're here with us still. Cliff, I know you've been to Chidambaram. <laughs> That's what I was going to say is the experience that Renee and I had. By coincidence, we got to go to Chidambaram at Shivaratri, the night of the vigil night of Shiva. And it was a very powerful, powerful experience. I was thinking there's that little guy that Shiva's dancing on. And I always thought that that little guy is the ego. And um, I, I, had the, I had this amazing experience at Chidanburam. It was a very, very real experience of, as human beings, we have different centers of consciousness. And I really felt while we were there that everybody was more in a, like a heart center and communicating with each other more from that center rather than from the neck up. Mm -hmm. And I came back to um, the United States and realized everybody was connecting to each other basically from the neck up. Whereas that Chinomaram experience helped me feel this other center. And I was wondering if Bharatanatyam and the dance of Bharatanatyam is, it, do you try and get some kind of center that's a deeper center through dance? Is that is that some kind of experience that you've had? interesting question um because i think as a dancer there's sort of two levels that i can answer this question at um and the first is that you know my vadnam which is like i said the longest type of dance that a, a dancer can perform my vadnam was 53 minutes long and when you're dancing for 53 minutes straight your body is 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 well, let's just say it takes training. It takes effort. And it's not all bliss. It's not all, it's not that sense of I'm, I'm connected to the universe. I'm, I'm dancing my way through life with ease and grace and joy. It's, it's work. Um, and of course there is that sense when you, when you, when you feel yourself hit the beat exactly what you, the way you wanted to, when you, when you see the audience responding in the emotive way that, you know, sorry, my cat wishes to participate. Um, when you see that sort of reaction that you, that you were hoping for, yes, that that's a moment of extreme satisfaction for the self. Um, and at the same time, yes, I think that there is that sense of connection with the audience that shared emotive experience is very centering. It's very grounding. It's very, um, you feel like you've done something right uh, on, a, on a grander level. But again, I think that that combined with the physical reality, the strenuous reality of what you're doing um, has has to contribute to that as well. So it, it almost wouldn't be as worth it if it weren't for the struggle of, of the actual performance. Um, so yes, I think, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Um. I wanted to uh, thank 
the speaker for the wonderful presentation. It, it really comes alive. And I appreciate what, what Cliff just said about the Nataraja image. And I, I just wanted to share that that image, you know, with the, the circle of flames coming out, uh, really represents how Shiva dancing represents creation, preservation, and destruction all at once. Because those flames are basically our Shakti energy, the energy that preserves the entire universe, as does the dance. And to some extent, the, the little dwarf that uh, she was dancing on represents the ego, but, but the negative side of the ego, the side we have to kind of step on and step down on so that our greed, anger, and delusion especially disappear. And the final image I would mention is that uh, in Shiva's hair, there's an image of the Ganges River with the goddess Ganges dancing. And so that connects to this world as well. So the dancing is cosmic, but it's also this very world. So uh, Hinduism is very interesting in that whichever of the main figures you focus on, they have all three of these aspects. So when Krishna comes down, he represents creation, preservation, and destruction of the world. So, uh, yeah, and I think the dancing from a particular point of view is, is fascinating. So I wanted to thank everyone for that image that the speaker gave. Lana. I think we need your microphone. That would help. Um, I thank you so much. It was really interesting. I don't know much about Hinduism. And so what I was trying to feel, when you said um, a cosmic dance, we are instruments and the universe plays us. That really struck me because um, I was thinking about the main thing that I heard was the bringing together of the paradoxes, the opposites. And so much of when we live in our head, there is a linear or it has to be right or wrong or it has to be good or bad. But when you were talking about living from the heart, Cliff, it's like there is a difference that includes both. And how do we, and we've talked about this, how do we include those that think differently than us? How do we um, include all that's happening in the world and still come from a place of love? And um, I really like that idea. And what the other one was that you were talking about was the, uh, the, um, it's an illusion that we have any control. And, and I think there is something uh, about really when we dance, um, I'm not really a dancer, but I did try hula and I did have tried different dances. But when I'm in my head, I can't do it. I, I mean, I really can't. But when I let go, I mean, I think we have to do all the exercise to learn the dance and all that. But it seems like to me what I notice, um, even when you're talking about when you're in the dance, it does take stamina, but it's almost like surrendering and surrendering to the cosmic dance and moving from your head to your heart and just being present in the moment. And I think that for me is where the cosmic dance is, is being present in the moment and really surrendering that we don't know. And um, we can practice all we can, but we never know what's gonna happen. And uh, so I felt that if I'm thinking of myself as a cosmic dancer, it's holding those paradoxes and also being willing to surrender to what is in this moment and just to let go and just trust. So thank you. If I can respond to that, I think uh, something I took away from what you said and, and something that a friend of mine has said to me many times recently is you, you have to be um, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. think a lot of vulnerability is, is, comes from a place of we've been punished for it at different times in our life um, in some sense. And that's like that's 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 what it feels like to dance sometimes is why would i do this to myself like <laughs> i'm like 40 minutes through 53 and, and i'm like what is what is this <laughs> how how am i gonna get through to the end but um i think at that point you just have to embrace it right like you said surrender um to the idea that you may not make it accept the possibility that failure is, is there and it's a real thing and maybe that just makes easier and i think there's something also about knowing that i'm upheld no matter what happens that i can put my best effort in that but no matter what uh, occurs or what comes comes that there is some 
knowing inside me that I'm upheld or that I am guided or something. And that that's all part of what the lessons of my life are. I don't really know about lessons of life, but about that that's where I'm learning to to really embrace more of who I am and allow myself to just be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Janani, I, as you were describing, uh, just the strenuous nature of this 53 minute long dance, which I was, um, you know, thinking of in terms of the, I'm not going to try to say the name because I'll, I, I want to say it correctly, but the, the dance of the bliss of creation and what a vigorous dance that is that Shiva does. Um, I was just wondering if there was some sense that you had of that part of yourself that was involved in all this dancing, kind of like the, you know, fires <laughs> surrounding um, Shiva Nataraj that um, Bob mentioned, or the activity of his forearms and legs all in motion, and yet that observer aspect of yourself that is like that still center that he seems to hold, you know, in all this motion, he still has that absolutely still center that is outside the universe, shall we even say, not even part of it. Was that part of your experience? Um, in a very literal sense, yes. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried balancing on one foot, but it requires a good deal of core strength. <laughs> um, and most of us have to hold on to some kind of outside support, right? I think that's the that's the figure you're describing is is or the visual I'm getting is is there's some kind of there's something bigger, right? That um, that if we try hard enough, we can hold on to for support. Um, but it almost it almost makes me ask the question like does does Shiva experience that struggle when he's holding that pose like every idol of his holds that essence in in it right like the world is really the idol and the statues that we see in in the Elephant Island carvings in in the studio at uh, the Still and Moving Center. Um, you know, are each of those individual points of stillness around which we move and um, sort of circumambulate, as as is a common practice in Hindu temples. Just a thought. I always thought of that uh, as being more like a snapshot of Shiva in continual motion, like we're just getting a, a slice of his absolutely um, incessant uh, motion. Yeah, I can see that. Too. I think, I think there's something to be said for like, considering our because I said I hadn't thought of the idea of everyone being part of the cosmic dance in that way, like every single one of us is a as Diana said, a cosmic dancer. Um, and I think it just spoke to me because I, I was like, well, what if there is just the cosmic dancer and we're just the parts of that body. Yes, yes. I think we need to let you go, don't we? I think it's it's about time for me to head out. But thank you so much for hearing me out and um, sharing all of your lovely thoughts as well. I hope to make it to another one of these. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> well, it was wonderful, wonderful having you. We're so grateful. Thank you for making time and good luck with the performances you have going on this week. Thank you so much. Drop into the chat how people can attend if you have time to do oh, that. Of course. Let me let me just find the link really fast. I'll go on mute. Okay. Cliff, do you want to say something that she could at least hear if she can't address? No, just thank you so much. I, I had a question, but it's too late for that. <laughs> Well, you can bring it up and we'll we'll see how we can all entertain the question. Well, to me, it's just amazing. I mean, it's hard to imagine being able to memorize all the moves to do 53 minute dance. And I was thinking about Hula, there's stories, there's 
usually in hula there's a story being told and i was wondering if there's a storyline thread that goes through a lot of the Bharatanatyam dances that can help you connect all that complexity up. That was my question. <laughs> uh, it's it, The answer is sometimes. Um, so there's some dances that are purely rhythmic and some dances that are uh, purely expression-based and some dances that are a mix of both. Uh, like I said, the dance that I performed at Chidambaram is a Varnam. So it's, it's storytelling interspersed with like really fast paced rhythmic segments. So I'm struggling to find this link, but I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions as if, if necessary, or just to have the conversation flow. Okay. Thanks for that answer. Yeah. Elizabeth, is, you seem to recognize John Ani. Did you want to make a comment or question? No comment, no question. I've danced with Janani before. I'm, I've learned from her before. So I'm still very new to Bharatanatyam and knowing, learning about things, but I'm just happy to learn more. So <laughs> thanks for letting me sit in. Yeah, yeah. Um, it really is quite a remarkable practice. And um, combined with the um, Indian musical system, and rhythmic system, I think probably one of the most complex dance formats in the world. Um, I don't know any that equals it actually in terms of its layers of, of complexity and um, just the, the number of musical scales that they might be dancing in, the number of different rhythms they might be dancing in. It, it's, it's really quite uh, staggering, <laughs> the having um, taken some Bhartanatyam lessons over the years, um, just the the actual holding of the different <laughs> finger positions in and of itself is quite a challenge. Um, and <laughs> I mean, I'm having to bend my fingers into the right positions. <laughs> <laughs> to achieve them sometimes. <laughs> Sharone. Plus, if you're ever in a thumb war, though. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> I don't um, have... I found... okay. I've, sorry, I found the link, and I put my email in the chat as well if there were any other questions, but I think now has come. the time has come for me to say goodbye and have oh. a very lovely evening, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That was amazing, Janani. Thank you. It was. Uh, all I wanted to add is it's nothing too deep. I just wanted to agree with you. I I am a dancer. Like I grew up dancing. Like Cuba is all about dancing, and I train in a lot of different things. And I remember for the love of dance a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, that was my first time being exposed to this dance, and she made us all try it out. And I was just amazed of how hard it is. She first did a demo, and you know the ego was like, oh that that looks okay. Like, you know, I can learn it. And then I put myself into it and it was so humbling. It was like, no, <laughs> this is uh, so difficult and tricky and all the little details that go to it. And then she talked about the story and it was even more fascinated. And I felt in a way part of that cosmic dance of like, I'm being burned into, burned into this new amazing thing, but at the same time, so defeated. Like, I don't know how to do it. don't know how to react to it. Um, so yeah, really interesting. Since then I've been reading a lot about it and learning and yeah, I definitely admire the strength and endurance that it takes to be able to go through all of that because it's not only physical, it's mental and right, it's everything. Um, yeah. I just um, want to go ahead. Our first Bharatanatyam teacher at Stella Moving Center joined us within a month, I think, after we opened. And uh, she uh, originally came from Germany. By the time I knew her, she had studied one on one with a Bharatanatyam teacher for a decade. Um, she had been in Sri Lanka, on the large island just south of South India, where Bharatanatyam comes from. And uh, she encountered this teacher. She was just 
um, planning on going and becoming a medical doctor, and she was uh, spending some time working at a um, German Ayurvedic retreat center. She came to manage that center. Um, and she encountered this Bhartanatyam dance teacher, and just something, something clicked between the two of them. And the teacher was at this transitional point that she had just graduated um, another dancer, no doubt after a long period of study, and she was um, just in a period of waiting for her next pupil to sign up, and that was Sonia Saronin. And um, as she uh, got to know this person, and they made this um, pact between the two of them that yes, Sonia would begin to study this this art. Uh, Sonia was not allowed to see a Bharatanatyam performance for the first two to three years that she was studying with this woman. All of it had to come from inside out. And so even as it you know, has this very precise look on the outside. It's just, you know, every angle of the body is very precisely crafted, sculpted. There is a very deep interior nature um, to how she, she came to learn all of those moves. And... Uh, it's just fascinating to me when we think of how many of the other movement formats we learn by copying. S see it, do it, put it on our body, try it on. And, and she learned exactly the opposite way. So I don't know exactly what it is about this, this dance format. Um, it seems like it's more of a spiritual experience um, than dan dance as a spiritual experience coming from the inside versus dance I'm going to perform or I'm going to learn something. It seems like it's, I, I don't know anything about it, so I'm just hearing what you're saying. But when I hear that, it feels like it's a very spiritual experience and one that's a process of a deepening in a spiritual way or an understanding inside you so that you are living the dance and it's become it's coming from you versus just something you're learning or and it doesn't mean give anything less to any other form but it's not something that she was copying it's something that she was living mm -hmm. and perhaps the fact that she came from germany was such a unique thing i would imagine most um, Bharatanatyam teachers have students who have watched Bharatanatyam as, as their entire lives. They've been seeing Bharatanatyam performed. So maybe she was a very unique uh, student and got the opportunity to learn it from that more spiritual inside way. Wow. But the fact that it could be done, it says something about the dance form itself wow. uh, it makes me think that she was kind of like initiating and creating that process of creation from the inside out right it's isn't the dance all about creation and in a way destruction it's like the only way to create is right or like she was practicing that the way that the universe and the cosmos does it like yeah really fascinating Mm -hmm. um, what, what are all of your thoughts in terms of this idea of uh, participating in the cosmic dance? It's, it's not just a, a Hindu uh, idea. Um, Thomas Merton, I believe, is a Catholic mystic. Is that right, Bob? Yeah. Uh, and he speaks of um, the cosmic dance. So 
it doesn't just have to be a Hindu perspective that would allow us to think of the cosmic dance. So just throwing it out there to everyone, what what comes to you in regard to all of us, in a sense, participating in the cosmic dance? Well, I think I already said it. I think that we all are actually part of a <clears throat> dance, that we all have our role and our way of de being, whether it uh, it's how we act and how we respond and and how we are in the world and where that where does that come from? Does it come from the head or the heart? And for me, it's all a spiritual experience. And it's like, I think we all do play uh, with the paradoxes. And um, if we want to see all of life, we're all one. If we're seeing all of life, we all have our, our role or our way of being, and it all contributes to this grand dance that we're all doing together. Mm, I see. So you're thinking of a, a, a stage like filled with dancers interweaving and creating patterns and coming in and out of the dance. Am, am well, I, I didn't picture that, but that's good. I didn't picture that. <laughs> Interesting. I just saw us all in the world dancing, um, not on a on, on a stage, but all of us interacting, you know, the grocery store, how we're interacting there is all they're all part of this big cosmic dance that we're part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also <clears throat> the cosmic dance represents the God dancing through us as well. You know, when we look at the uh, Nataraja around it, each flame represents each of us and it's it's not static there's one thing about fire is that fire is constantly dancing it it can't stand still heraclitus said that's what the world is made out of fire because it never stops dancing it never stops moving and so we could look at that and say that's that's us and that image is is never meant to be static because the world dances we dance and like fire it never stops Mm -hmm. Beautiful, wonderful. Yeah, Cliff. Well, I, I just think the idea of participating in the cosmic dance, just that that phrase is so evocative in itself. And I think in the West, um, we tend to think of things so intellectually. And when we think of things intellectually, we tend to think of things linearly, like the idea of progress and achieving goals and past, present, and future. But if you ask yourself, well, does the universe have a purpose? Probably it would be hard to say, of course, but it certainly isn't the way we would think of as purpose. But if if we're if the purpose is this celebration that this dance and the experience of timeless, the timeless present, it seems that that's kind of what we're pointing at is it's something it's something other than the way we normally think with our analytical minds of um achieving some kind of um deep centered experience through somehow tapping into that cosmic dance yeah um it made me think of the word cyclical yeah you see it's not lineal yeah it, it's like the cyclical nature and they all things rhythm and harmony that's what I think of the cosmic dance is almost like I have this little kid child's imagination imagine like you know you, the whole universe and the stars and the moon and the planet all turning around and dancing together doing their thing yeah Thank you for that visual clip. No, oh, you carried the ball. You ran with it. That's great. <laughs> I was experiencing all that while you were talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, when you said, Cliff, the timeless present, um, that that was a good description 
to me of my image of Shiva Nataraja as being always in motion and we're just getting, you know, a, a little slice look at, at one place that he is, but that just represents the whole, even though it looks as if it's a still image, it is the timeless present ever moving but ever still because at any any time it it's just a slice it's a still slice right at any instant but we can't slice time that finely um this is a favorite theme of mine that's hard to talk about <laughs> About how between every instant of time there's another second and between that and the one next to it there's an there's one in the middle of that <laughs> yeah. it's probably why you named your dance studio the, the name you gave it it's probably related yeah <laughs> <laughs> It would be um, it would be nice if someone uh, could find that part of the T. S. Eliot um, poem um, at the still point of the turning world. Um, that would be nice before we end to take a look at that. What's the poem? It's a poem by T. S. Eliot, and it'll it'll be hard to look up. Uh, under that name, but the phrase is at the still point of the turning world. It's uh, found in four quartets, and the fourth quartet is Little Giddings. So I, I don't have a handy, but if you're Googling it, that's a way to find it. <laughs> that was in the back of my mind uh, when I was thinking about this participation in the cosmic dance. Isn't, it, isn't there something about there's only the moment in the rose garden or something like that. I, you know the you know it better than it. Uh, what what are some of the ideas in that quote, Renee? You know some of them. Well, he, um, th that uh, at the still t point of the turning world. There's the dance in it. There's only the dance. That's, that's all there is, is the dance. And so it's, I think it's related to this idea that um, when we uh, see what a, a representation, for example, of an atom, and what we see, I guess, is the whirling electrons, but even those electrons that make it seem as though with these, you know, tremendous microscopes that we can see an atom, those are just made out of energy. And um, it's as if there's nothing but energy. And that's not a thing. <laughs> All the things that we see are nothing. And, and that's uh, suggested by um, what um, Janani was mentioning about Chidambaram. The secret of Chidambaram is behind the curtain and you pull the curtain and there's nothing there. And, and, there, and that's Shiva who's simultaneously nothing and is somehow creating being the entire universe at the same time. There's also a reference to the, the cyclical nature of it, to return again to the still point and know it for the first time. So that's an interesting way of looking at cyclical, that you return, but it's all new. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that is part of that. And also the idea that he mentions all these 
different um, instances, the, the something at Smokefall and... Um, I think I found it. It's pretty long, but there is a part that it says, just a minute, um, there is a part that says, at the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fl flesh That's left. Yeah, can it? you do that whole thing? That's it. I mean, it's pretty long. You want me to read the whole thing? Well, well I'll that I'll part. Tell you to stop. <laughs> okay. um, well, it's oh, okay. Okay, tell me when it's it's very long, but time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in past time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been seen as an abstraction, remaining a, perpet a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. But what might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. Footfalls echo in the memory. Down the passage which we take did not take, towards the door we never opened. Into the rose garden, my words echo thus in my in your mind. But to what purpose? Disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves, I do not know. Other echoes inhabit the garden. Shall we follow? Quick, said the bird, find them, find them. Around the corner, through the first gate, into our first world, shall we follow. The deception of the thrush. In our first world, there are, were there. They were dignified, invisible, moving without pressure over the dead leaves in the autumn heat. Through the vibrant air, the bird called in response to the unheard music hidden in the shrubbery. And the unseen eye beam crossed for the roses. Had the look of flowers that are looked at? There, was, they, there they were as our guests, accepted and accepting. So we moved and they in a formal pattern along the empty alley into the box circle to look down into the drain pool, dry the pool, dry concrete, brown edged, and the pool was filled with water out of a sunlight and lotus rose quietly, quietly. The surface glimmer glittered out of light, a uh, heart of light, and they were behind us reflected in the pool. Then a cloud passed and the pool was empty. Go, said the bird, for the leaves were full of children hidden excitedly, containing laughter. Go, 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 said the bird. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Time and pa time past and time future. What might have been, what has been, point to one end, which is always present. I'm going to skip the next little part and go to, at the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards. At the still point, there's, there the dance is but neither arrest nor movement, but do not call it fixity. Where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point. There would be no dance, and there is only the dance. I can only say that, that we have been, but I cannot say where, and I not, cannot say how long, for that is no, is a place in time for that is to place it in time. The inner freedom from the practical desire, the release from action and suffering, release from the inner and the outer compulsion, yet surrounded by a grace of sense, a white light still and moving, uh, without motion, concentration, without elimination, both a new world and the old made explicit, understood in the comp completion of its partial ecstasy the resolution of its partial horror, yet the enchantment of past and future, woven in the weakness of the changing body, protects mankind from heaven and damnation, which flesh cannot endure. Time past and time future allow but a little consciousness. To be conscious is not to be in time, but only in time can the movement moment in the rose garden, the moment in the arbor where the rain beat, the moment in the droughty church at snow, smoke fall, be remembered, involved with, involved with past and future. Only through time is canceled. There's something about that poem that to me has everything to do with Shiva Nataraj mm -hmm. and this sense of the timeless in time and this, the stillness within the motion of the dance. 
And I am curious um, with everybody about this idea of the observer, that whether there are times in the dance of your life and whether that dance is actually, you know, moving your feet to music, I don't mean that, but are there moments, especially in the dance of your life, when you have that sense of um, that still observing self watching the whole outside experience that you're going through. I would like to hear something real quick. Um, I am I embody more in my mind and myself the moving part of like the dance. I feel like I'm always dancing or jumping with my mind onto things, monkey mind all the time, monkey body. And stillness is really, really difficult to find. And I've been reading this book called Stillness Speak by Eckhart Tolle. It's just a very brief summary of the power of now, but it's like an everyday book that you can read. And something that really helped me to make harmony with the stillness and the moving and, you know, the back and forth is listening to the silence. That's something he says on the book. And he just says, just listen to the silence. And when I bring the focus and I bring the awareness to the silence, even if there's a million things going on, I get to be the observer for two seconds, three seconds. And that's just such a hack I, I found the last couple of months reading the book. So that's a good dance. That's good. Yeah, yeah. This is the I'd like to also suggest my husband's book, Peaceful Light. It's a children's book that he's written from his Boundless Intimacy book that really speaks to this idea of the timeless moment of now. And uh, Peaceful Light is, um, I think, would be a book that would be interesting when we're talking about this. And then his book, Boundless Intimacy, goes into a lot more depth about this timeless moment of now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Any of the men want to mention something on this regard? I, I think everybody could relate to something about the symbolic nature of dance. <laughs> Diana? I can. I thought it was an excellent springboard and a, whole, a lot of new concepts for me, the way that she talked about the dance, because I'm not familiar with it. But I love that the we could springboard to that, to the paradoxes and the the cosmic dance that we all um, follow and the timeless moment of now. So I really appreciated her talk and you could see she embodies it. And, and that was her energy and the way she speaks and her devotion is just beautiful. So thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Janani. And thank you everyone for your attendance today. Aloha. <laughs>